Hello everyone, welcome to session three of LTEC 651. In today's video, we're going to explore graphic types and image text relations. We'll talk more about what that actually means in just a minute. Then we're going to examine the technical aspects of multimedia production, and we'll close out by previewing some multimedia authoring tools. Now I wanted to say great job on Critical Reflection 2. I really enjoyed your detailed analysis and evaluation of the sample multimedia. And I thought you did a great job of actually walking through the rubric step by step to justify and explain your different scores. Now, you might be wondering, what was the class average? Now, remember, the rubric had 11 different elements, five points each for a total possible score of 55. Well, the class average was 27.57. So about 50% on that rubric. There was a standard deviation of about six points. The lowest score in the whole class was 14 out of 55, and the maximum score assigned was 40 out of 55. So some of this variation can be explained, of course, in that difference is in opinions and perspectives. And of course, we're all new to learning about these multimedia learning principles. So some of our understanding of what the principles mean and what they look like in action varies a little bit. So I hope that was a helpful exercise for you to all go through. Now, I did want to address a couple of questions that came up. Now, this is a question that was sent in by Lawrence, and he asked, do multimedia learning principles apply to more interactive environments, such as educational games or virtual reality? This is a great question. And Lawrence pointed out this quote from the Mayer reading on page 416, where Mayer acknowledges that most of the research that's been done on multimedia learning has been done with narrated animations, and slideshows. And so there's a lot of open questions about whether or not the multimedia learning principles apply to newer things like instructional video, educational games, virtual reality, and mobile devices. So one thing that I want to point out is that that research is happening now. Every time a new technology platform emerges, multimedia learning researchers actually study these things to see, do these multimedia learning principles hold up in these new contexts. So the way that I actually want to answer this question is by thinking about, well, what changes and what doesn't? Now, in terms of what does not change, we know that human cognitive architecture does not change. In other words, the way the human brain is designed and implemented to process information does not change. Now, there is some variation from one person to the next, but overall, from generation to generation, our cognitive systems are relatively fixed. And so that's one of the universal things that I really want you to take away from this course, is that no matter whether you're designing a worksheet, a slideshow, an instructional video, or a virtual reality experience, the human cognitive system that's going to be processing those experiences is going to be more or less the same. So that's important point number one. Important point number two is that the technology will always continue to change. And so we have to keep that in mind, and each time a new technology emerges, such as augmented reality or virtual reality, it's up to us to think about, do these learning principles still apply, or do we need new research to identify new principles, or do we need to modify the way we apply the principles given the changes that the technology is bringing about? So really an excellent question that helps us understand the relationship between human cognitive architecture and multimedia and technology. So thanks for that question. Another question that came up was submitted by Madeline, and she asked, is maximizing germane cognitive load the same as maximizing generative processing? And the short answer is kind of yes and no. Cognitive load and cognitive processing are related, but not the same. So let me expand on that just a little bit. Cognitive load, we've learned, refers to the mental effort required to make sense of something. Now, ideally, we want the majority of, of learners' mental effort to be germane or relevant to constructing understanding. 
And that is, of course, as opposed to being wasteful or unnecessary. Cognitive processing, in contrast, refers to the specific cognitive tasks learners need to perform to learn something new. Examples of these cognitive tasks include selecting, organizing, integrating. And if you were to study cognitive psychology, you could learn a lot more about how we break down cognitive tasks. Now, ideally, we want the majority of learners' cognitive tasks to be generative or productive in constructing understanding, as opposed to being unproductive. So the answer to Madeline's question is yes and no. The two concepts are related, but not exactly the same. So thanks for that question. I hope that sheds a little bit of light on it. So with that in mind, let's get into the main topic of today's video. All right. I want to begin by exploring the multimedia principle in a bit more detail. So far, we've learned that providing relevant graphics with text is a proven way of fostering deeper cognitive processing in learners. Something that I want you to be aware of related to this principle is the fact that not all graphics used in multimedia instruction are equally effective. In fact, learners often misjudge the value of illustrations. And it turns out that students actually have difficulty distinguishing illustrations that help them learn from those that do not help them learn. This reality means that we, as designers, should only use highly relevant instructional illustrations. It also means designers should point out in the text what to look for in illustrations. Now, one of the important takeaways from research on the multimedia principle is recognizing that graphics can serve different purposes in multimedia instruction. Fortunately, researchers have provided us with an excellent breakdown of six graphic types and how they do or do not add value to the learning process. The first graphic type is decorative. These are visuals added for aesthetic appeal and or for humor. An example is a person riding a bike in a lesson about how a bicycle pump works. The picture is topically relevant, but has nothing to do with how a bike pump actually works. The second graphic type is representational, and these are visuals that illustrate the appearance of an object, such as a photo of equipment. The third graphic type is organizational, and these are visuals that show qualitative relationships among content, such as a tree diagram. The fourth graphic type is relational, and these are visuals that summarize quantitative relationships. An example of a relational graphic would be a weather map with colors being used to represent different temperatures. A fifth graphic type is transformational, and these are visuals that illustrate changes in time or over space. This might be a time-lapse animation, for example, of a seed germinating. The sixth and final type of graphic is interpretive, and these are visuals that make intangible phenomena visible and concrete. An example of an interpretive graphic might be a picture that shows how data is transmitted through the internet, something that we can't really see in the real world because it is too small. Okay, so now that we know about these six graphic types, let's analyze the using computer ports example. What kind of graphics were used in this multimedia instructional message? Well, I would say the images of the ports and the cables are representational graphics. They're there to illustrate the appearance of real world objects. In this case, the computer ports themselves and their corresponding cables. Also, while I have this screenshot up, I want to point out the excellent use of signaling in this example. By signaling, I mean the orge outline surrounding the HDMI port, which signals to the learner that this port is used for a cable that looks like the one shown on the left. This is an example of a design decision that promotes generative processing. It relates to germane cognitive load. After all, learners need to know what to pay attention to and how to integrate information to construct their own mental models. Accordingly, the signaling principle recommends that instructors add cues, such as these orange lines, to direct learners' attention to salient material. All right, let's move on. While we're talking about the multimedia principle, I wanted to talk a little bit about the importance of text-image relationships. 
In other words, what are the different ways text and image can be related? Believe it or not, there's an entire area of research addressing this very question. For example, here's a tree diagram outlining the equality of text and image. Now, personally, before I got into designing multimedia, these were things I had never thought about before. Here's another attempt to create a taxonomy of text-image relationships. In fact, these researchers identified over 40 different possibilities, which they've outlined here in this table. Now, that's a little too detailed for our purposes, so let me share another interesting analysis of text-image relationships from Lewis's 2012 book titled Reading Contemporary Picture Books. In this book, Lewis argues there is a range of text-image relationships that go from symmetrical on the one hand all the way to contradictory on the other. So let's look at a few specific examples. So one possible relationship between text and image is one that is symmetrical. And according to Lewis, a text-image relationship is symmetrical when the text and image come as close as possible to conveying the same information or telling the same story. Another possible relationship is one of enhancement. And a text-image relationship is an enhancement when one element, either the image or the text, significantly changes the meaning of the other. A third possible relationship is that of counterpoint. A text-image relationship is a counterpoint when images and text provide different kinds of information that the reader must make some effort to reconcile and integrate. This, of course, is closely related to the active processing assumption, the idea that learners have to select, organize, and integrate information in working memory. The fourth possible relationship is one of contradiction. A text-image relationship is deemed a contradiction when images and texts seem to be saying entirely different things. So what do these four possible text-image relationships tell us about the using computer ports example? Well, in this example, we're seeing text-image relationships that provide enhancement. For example, because in the image on the top, we see the letters HDMI printed above one port of the computer. And we see additional text that helps us understand that those letters actually mean something. It turns out HDMI stands for High Definition Multimedia Interface. This is an example of an enhancement. While we could do a lot more analysis here of the image and the text, I think you get the idea. And I do encourage you to reflect on what's possible in terms of text-image relationships as we move forward this semester. In this next section, I'd like to talk about the skills, materials, and tools of multimedia authoring, or as it is stated in the title of the class, multimedia production. Importantly, we need to realize that multimedia production is very much an interdisciplinary endeavor. It involves several skill sets to varying degrees. For example, multimedia production almost certainly involves instructional design skills. Instructional design, of course, is the practice of systematically designing, developing, and delivering instructional products and experiences. The goal of instructional design is to create instruction that is efficient, effective, and meaningful. Now, in addition to instructional design skills, more and more multimedia production involves web design skills. And of course, web design is the practice of creating presentations of content that are delivered online. The goal of web design is to use appearance, layout, and content to create a design that is easy to use, aesthetically pleasing, and suits the user group and, if necessary, the brand. Of course, today's multimedia projects also have interfaces. Thus, user interface design skills are very relevant. Interface design is the practice of making interfaces and software with a focus on looks and style. Its goal is to create designs that users find easy to use and pleasurable. Now, arguably, a fourth skill area has to do with interactivity because today's multimedia is generally not static. Thus, we may want to draw on interaction design skills. So what is interaction design? Well, interaction design is the practice of making interactive products and services. Its goal is to provide the best way for people to solve a task or reach a particular goal. 
it emphasizes behavior and what users do physically to engage with the multimedia presentation. Now, all of these skills overlap to some degree, and you don't necessarily need to be an expert in all of them, but it is important to recognize the interdisciplinary nature of this kind of work. And at a minimum, I would argue that you should have enough knowledge of each of these areas to be conversant with clients and or collaborators working on a multimedia product. That well-roundedness will really set you apart from other designers. Okay, if those are some of the skills needed to create multimedia instructional messages, what are some of the tools people use? Well, to answer that question, we need to learn more about the language of user interfaces. After all, these days, most multimedia is something users see and interact with digitally. Therefore, it is ultimately software and has an interface. So what are the building blocks of user interfaces? While there's no definitive list, you could think of these building blocks as interface elements, components, or widgets. Each of these elements facilitates a specific type of interaction, either behavioral or cognitive. These interactions take place between the learner and the multimedia instructional message. And generally speaking, we can divide these elements into two categories. The first category contains content elements. These are all of the media that we know make up multimedia. The second category contains control elements. And these are all of the controls we use to control software. Examples include input controls such as checkboxes, radio buttons, and drop-down menus. Other examples include navigational controls such as breadcrumbs, sliders, and search fields. There's also informational controls such as tooltips, progress bars, and notifications. Taken together, these are some of the main building blocks that we're going to be using to create rich multimedia experiences. So let's apply these building blocks to the using computer ports example. We can do this by asking ourselves what interface elements were required to create this multimedia instructional message. Well, on one level, this example is nothing more than text and pictures. However, on another level, it is so much more than that. In some ways, it is a carefully designed interactive multimedia experience. So what interface elements were needed to create this experience from the ground up? Well, obviously there's text and images, and there's hotspots and a timer, there's a button, there's a text input field, that's how the application knows our names. There's a drag and drop interaction to allow us to move the cables to the proper ports. And there's even a progress bar in a percent gauge to help us track our progress. That's quite a few interface elements just to build this simple example. So what's actually needed to build something like this? Well, we've talked about the skills and we've talked about some of the materials, but what about the tools? Well, as you can probably imagine, we need some sort of authoring environment to put everything together. An authoring environment is simply software made for creating and arranging content into standardized structures that can be exported and shared in different ways. Now, on the screen, we're seeing a sampling of some of the e-learning authoring software that currently exists. And as you can see, there's a lot of them. This is a very crowded and fast-moving sector and each of these companies is trying to gain market share and differentiate itself. They all offer different combinations of tools and services. Some of them web-based, some of them are not. Some of them are cross-platform, some of them are not. But they're all trying to solve common challenges involved in producing instructional multimedia. Examples of these common challenges include how do we create high-quality multimedia but do it quickly? Another challenge is how do we ensure original creative multimedia while supporting standardized formats and delivery mechanisms? And a third common challenge is how do we create effective multimedia if we don't have a huge team of designers and developers to support us? Now, this week in Critical Reflection 3, we'll be taking a closer look at some of these companies and the products that they're offering. Here's a more detailed look at one of the main players in this space, which is Articulate Storyline 360. And you can read a little bit about this software package. They're really trying to help people by bringing everything together 
in the sense that it provides authoring tools, it provides digital assets such as images and videos, and there's even live training. I want to point out that the cost of this type of software is relatively high. I think last year the education pricing for Storyline 360 was about $500 a year. So that's something to keep in mind as you watch this space. Okay, so we've looked at quite a few examples. I want to end by previewing the kinds of multimedia content that can be built with these skills, materials, and tools. Ultimately, all of these things are designed to create reusable interactive content, such as interactive videos, quizzes, simulations, and games. And in the second half of the semester, we'll begin authoring our own examples of multimedia instructional messages. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.